I'm Richard Gibbs and I'm the director of the Baylor College of Medicine Human Genome Sequencing Center at the uh, Baylor College of Medicine in the Texas Medical Center in Houston, Texas. When and where were you born? I was born in Australia in a small town called Warnambu that is on the southern coast, on the great southern ocean there. Uh, and I uh, was schooled in Australia. I went to uh, you know, secondary school there. I went to Melbourne University, pursued a degree in genetics and biochemistry. And then I pursued a doctoral study in radiation biology until 1986 when I moved to the United States. What brought you to the United States? I did come to Houston and that's where I've been and done my uh, bulk of my professional career. Um, I came uh, as a postdoctoral fellow to pursue general opportunity in science. The particular link was that I had used a gene, the hypoxanthine phosphoribosol transferase gene, HPRT, which was a very valuable cellular marker in radiation biology studies. That gene was among the first uh, to be cloned in humans. I think it was the third human gene cloned. And it was cloned in the laboratory of Dr. Thomas Kasky, who was in Houston at that time, and who provided an environment where one could come and do a postdoctoral fellowship and explore uh, molecular genetic issues related to that gene. When did you first become aware of the Human Genome Project? Well, I arrived in the US in February of 1986, and there was a Cold Spring Harbor Quantitative Symposium that year where the uh, project was discussed and PCR was discussed and a few other things. And the, um, the fruits of that symposium were kind of the general discussion. Now I have to say that PCR was a bigger deal than the Genome Project at that time uh, because it was really the, the next increment in where our insights were guiding us. We, the things we wanted to know were enabled so well by PCR. And so that was, the, that was the thing that really grabbed us. But the general tone tenet, the general notion of sequencing the genome um, was really, uh, was there then and uh, came, I guess, more strongly in the years to come, the, the immediate years to come. Were you aware of the early opposition to the HGP? What were your thoughts on its feasibility? So it was a, a smorgasbord of, of issues that were sort of laid down with the suggestion of doing the genome. So the technical ones, it was clearly not possible with the technology of the time. I mean, not possible in any kind of sensible way. We needed technical increments to get there. Um, as a social scientific issue, it was pretty clear there was opposition to it. And the opposition was kind of guided by individuals who had a fiscal argument. And I think individuals who had a philosophical argument. We don't do science that way. Uh, you know, and, and I, have to, I have to say that the uh, None of those arguments seemed to be particularly strong to me, really, I'd say, even at that time. And I was pretty green too, remember? I was a, you know, a kid from the other side of the world, you know, in my late 20s, and uh, it was all new to me. But even then, I think those arguments didn't resonate as we can't do this. And this you know, we, did, we went to the moon, so we've conquered that kind of in, un, unsurmountable, insurmountable technical challenge before. So there were arguments, I heard them, but they weren't overwhelming. How did the early HGP catalyze and go beyond advances in molecular biology in the late 1980s? Because of my background and because of the work I was immediately doing in Houston, we had a thirst for DNA sequence and for technology. Now, our problem in front of us was we had human genes that we knew caused disease, but we had very little knowledge of what kind of changes in the genes were happening and whether different kinds of changes may be correlated with different kinds of phenotype. So this is kind of a golden era, uh, era of human molecular genetics. We're beginning to discover more genes. This was before the CF gene was known and muscular dystrophy gene was not known at that time, but we had linkage information pointing to it. That was 89, right? And this was 86, 87. So there were a few techniques that had come along to interrogate gene structure that were better than um, uh, southern blotting, which was essentially the standard before that. And we were at the forefront of developing those technologies. So the PCR came along and we melded everything we were thinking into PCR guided applications. So uh, techniques that you probably take for granted, or people who listen to this will take for granted now, were really uh, developed then on the heels of the first PCR 
um, demonstrations. So, um, multiplex PCR for deletion detection. We did that. The use of Sanger sequencing to look at heterozygous positions in automated fluorescent sequences. That's kind of part of the menu of everybody uses today. We did that for the first time. Reverse transcription PCR, first paper that was out of us. So we had this tremendous burst of technical activity around figuring out what was wrong with individual genes to explain gene variation and phenotype variation. And so we needed sequence to do that. What were the limits of PCR, and how did early sequencing change disease gene identification? Well, so, so think, of, think of this uh, particular gene, the one I mentioned that brought me to the US, as kind of a microcosm of all things over those years, right? But of course, we were doing this at multiple loci. But the problem there was we couldn't do diagnostics or molecular characterization on in individuals prior prior to 1986. We couldn't, we couldn't do it without inference. So, so you could take a, a child with the disease. This is Eklink's disease, so the boys only have one copy. If you ever found out the mutation, you could go and track it in the family and in the mothers, but you couldn't effectively go and, or easily at all, go and look at it in women to ask, might they be carriers of the disease? Okay. So you know, like finding the mutation was hard. You could only really do it in, in hemizygosity. You certainly couldn't tackle random individuals. This is, this is the old days, right? So suddenly with PCR, we had some tools that we built to get there. But the thing we lacked actually was full locus sequence information. We had the cDNA, you know, we'd cloned the gene, or others had cloned the gene, we had the gene. We didn't have the flanking things, flanking the exons. So uh, a milestone project was undertaken, of which I was not a central part of, but I was on the peanut gallery too. So. Dr. Kasky will tell you, when, when you talk with him, I'm sure, about his work with Wilhelm and Sorge at Embel on the first fluorescent automated sequencer that was built by the Pharmacia Corporation, the ELF sequencer. And so uh, Wilhelm wanted to demonstrate its efficacy. So uh, uh, in Houston, we had the large genomic clones with the HPRT 44 KB locus in it. So that, that was a, an ideal candidate for a big piece of DNA. I mean, 40 kilobases, huge for us to sequence with an automated method, right? So the production of shotgun libraries was carried out in my lab with my, you know, some, with my colleagues, and those were, uh, my technician took them to Germany and stayed there and worked with Wilhelm's group generating the raw sequence. Now, this automated sequencer actually needed individuals to write down the bases as they came past the detector. So there was a lot of the automation wasn't really there. We, you know, we didn't have computers really. Yeah. I mean, we just had fancy word processors at that time. So you know the computer era. Uh, so an interesting development in that project was sequencing both ends of a subclone, right. which is a standard thing today. So there's a good story about that, which is that uh, that came about in that project was the first time it was used and used to anchor reads in assemblies. And the reason it came, out, it came about is because the shotgun libraries were made in M13, which is a single-stranded, uh, um, produces single-stranded virions, which you can then get a very pure DNA prep that's very good for priming and extending for sequencing. Now, after using a bunch of these clones from a library, the library was exhausted. There was no new clones to go to, but more raw sequence coverage was needed to get a shotgun assembly of this 44 kilobases. So the group decided they'd have to go back to the bacteria that secrete the single-stranded virus and extract the double-stranded form and use the other end just to get more sequence coverage. And then when they did that, and they built the assemblies, they said, well, you know, these things ought to go opposite each other. And that was the sequence map gap methods, which are in some of the early books you can find. So anyway, that project was a fabulous success, gave us the sequence that flanked the exons in that gene, and we were able to construct PCR primers for each exon, build a multiplex reaction, and then do the automated sequencing across them to look for any positions that in females would be heterozygous that could give risk to a child, a boy, if he inherited the one copy with the mutation. So all that evolved over the period of beginning of 1986 to probably 1990 or 1989. So that was sequencing-based development, right? 
And as you know, most of the discussion there was not really applied sequencing. It was a little bit of sequencing technology stuff, like which sequencing things should we use. But a lot of it was about back, yeah, cloning and you know other kind of whole genome -y things. And then there was this disease discovery angle that was sort of going on that was finding new genes around CF and muscular dystrophy and neurofibromatosis. And then all of those other low side. Were there two different distinct approaches to the genome in the early years? At the time, there was this perception that a few groups were just sort of doing genomics as gene discovery mm -hmm. and not thinking enough about the whole genome yeah. problem. And there were certainly individuals who were thinking a bit about the whole genome problem, but they weren't really human molecular geneticists. They weren't really interested in individual genes for disease. They certainly weren't clinical geneticists who were the guys who were driven to do that. Which scientists were thinking about the genome more holistically? Yeah, Maynard was a, you know, the master of being holistic. Um, and not too many others. I mean, there's plenty of voice, but not a lot of words, if you know what I mean. And, and so not too many I would point to who, I mean, Ron Davis, I yeah, think, was good. certainly the other person who in those days was really properly thinking about the, the composition um, of you know, the, these kind of problems. And, um, uh, you know, all, uh, Tom Hudson was in there with Eric Lander. They were kind of off on this mapping thing, I think, for its own sake, as far as I could tell, for, rather than pulling the problem all the way to its end point. So we dug in our heels at that time and said, there's going to be a sequencing, it's going to be a sequencing uh, future, and that's, that's what's going to pull this home. And didn't think a whole lot about, you know, issues like whether back clones would be better than yak clones or how we get rid of cosmids and, you know, forget land. But we kind of felt there was a, there was, that was going on. Someone, someone else, Mel Simon, of course, right. saved the day, right? right? And came from left field as far as many of us were concerned with um, uh, Shizua, the, his postdoc who, forgive me for not pronouncing his name correctly. The, um, uh, Mel came in and, you know, saved the day with backs and so... The, the EST stuff and the, I'm mixing up the years a bit here. A lot of that stuff sort of came and went and didn't impact this fundamental trajectory, in my view, of getting the right reagent, building a sequencing method that could be scaled enough, mm -hmm. and building our computational infrastructure, interpretive infrastructure around it. That were kind of the core things that, that happened. When did you start to think about the issues of cost, quality, and scalability of sequencing the genome? Well, um, I, I believe that there were several of us thinking about that, but in a fairly unstructured way. I mean, we kind of, you know, there's always this trinity, right? There's, there's cost, there's quality, and there's scalability. And we were tackling all of them, but we weren't sort of driven to one or the other at the earliest time because we were still feeling our way. But there was a pivotal meeting in one of these hotels. I can't remember if it was this hotel or one up the road or one across the road, but it was in a basement. It, Actually, I'm pretty sure it wasn't this one. It's the one with the escalator down to the basement. There was an impassioned discussion about cost at that meeting, I think, that gelled a lot of the other discussion going along. I mean, and I am confused in my mind about the timing of that meeting versus the Bermuda meetings versus some of the other program meetings we had. But, but there was certainly a meeting where um, uh, we had a long discussion about cost that... that so this was when we were down to like the 25 cents a base kind of place. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I remember Phil Green at the end of a long and passionate discussion saying, well, we better, it was something, you probably have the exact quote, but it was something like, yeah, we're all exhausted, right? And we'd all talk this through. And then Phil said, you know, we better double it just to be real. And so that put things in perspective. And, and one of the senior scientists wept during his talk. That's, I won't name him, but that was another piece of, of impassioned history you might pick up on. How did you go about establishing the Human Genome Sequencing Center at Baylor? I was this postdoctoral fellow with Dr. Kasky until about, nine, I think it was mid-1990. And uh, at that time, he was forming a, uh, a larger institutional structure, ultimately a department. And he was bringing on new faculty. And that was the time as a postdoctoral fellow that I went looking at other jobs. Ironically, I had two hot leads. I went and interviewed and was in a serious discussion with Francis in Michigan, and also in Atlanta, where there was, uh, with the Emory group was very strong. And uh, Dr. Kasky made me an offer, and I stayed and started my own lab. And uh, there was a small departmental core uh, 
that did sequencing. And I inherited that and became a, a departmental core for about two years. And the senior individual there was Donna Musney, who was a master's graduate from uh, College Station and enormously practical and enormously thorough. And now we've worked together for 30 odd years. And so she's uh, really the mainstay of the quality that we've been able to sustain in the center. So this was then a lab. So I had a lab opposite the core and I had kind of grad students and postdocs in my lab and I interacted with the core and they did this more process oriented stuff. But it became my sort of little cauldron for doing larger scale sequencing projects. So between 90 and 95, we had, uh, I had a grant, I forget, in about 92, that was for large scale sequencing. And it was enormous, it was like $600,000, which is very big R01 type grant of that time. And uh, it was for applying methods to large scale sequencing problems. And we undertook to sequence the human CD4 locus. That was a, a, a target. So our general interest at that time and my research interest at that time was to look at genetic variation for traits other than um, acute disease and the susceptibility to infectious disease was a very hot topic. This was before CCR5 was discovered, you see, which is, turns out to be the most important modulator of HIV uh, susceptibility. At the time we thought CD4 itself, which is the major receptor, might be polymorphic and that might explain some of the heterogeneity. So we thought, let's, let's look at um, uh, CD4 and look for polymorphisms in CD4. So that's a large sequencing project. We were gifted the clones by Dan Littman in New York and he'd cloned CD4 and we'd worked on those clones and did a large scale sequencing on that locus, which is actually not unlike HPRT. It's about 40 kilobases or so, I think 30, and has a bunch of exons, so it's a similar project. So we seeded our sequencing, our work with these kind of sequencing efforts. We picked on a few other regions. We we're interested in gene density in certain regions. We we're interested in part of the X chromosome and, and issues related to disease that were solved by sequencing. So we had a period of uh, where students and postdocs projects were all about sequencing and they would come in and make the clone and then do the sequence reactions and get help to load them on these early sequencing instruments and all that stuff which we used the core's infrastructure. So that got us through that period up until I think when you were asking about. How did your lab interact with other sequencing projects? So we were humming then. You know, I remember we met with, um, uh, of course the worm was getting uh, coming along and we were all good friends. We'd all meet and go to conferences and swap technologies and all of this stuff. Uh, I think Rick Wilson was coming along at, uh, in, at Wash U there with Elaine. Um, the, the Boston group didn't do much sequencing. They were just mapping, they really, and, but the, the, the Sanger group, of course, the Wash U and the Sanger were united by the Worm Project. What were your initial impressions of Solera and their approach to sequencing the genome? You know, I think we're all kind of wired in a certain way that we gravitate to certain kinds of ways of doing things. And Craig's splattering of EST sequences was not, we were not enamored of that. I mean, we didn't say it was a bad thing, but we said, that's not for us said, if we want to study a gene, we want to find the gene, explain it fully, and give a robust description of that gene. Now, I would say that at that time, we were, um, I was underappreciative of the power of some of these methods. And um, uh, so, but we certainly weren't wanting to follow in those footsteps. In fact, Tom Kasky, to whom I seem to be referring quite a bit, uh, was an advisor to Merck at that time, or perhaps just a little after that, and came back to say, guys, if you want to get on this train, Mercus and others are going to sponsor this EST program that I'm sure you know about. And I was kind of okay, you know, I was uh, maybe. And then when I heard that um, Washu had got that contract, I wasn't particularly phased. But I think, you know, looking back, that might have been an opportunity to leverage resources and so forth. But anyway, that's a long answer to your question of what do we think of Craig's. Were there concerns about the quality of the data being released during the Bermuda meetings? No, I don't think that, no one thought that was a great argument. Right. I think, the, to me, the, the only real pushback wasn't actually an active pushback. It was more like, yes, it's a great idea, but I don't know that people are going to be able to use it that much or they will want to use it because, because of those issues. But the notion, I think, that Craig, and you remind me now that Craig did press this idea of quality being an obstacle to people, 
and and I think some others might have echoed that too, but nobody really said, you're right. I mean, people said, no. Can you talk a little bit about the role of Phil Green in the HGP? At that early time, the project said we need mathematicians. And the mathematicians who came were first asked to do data management. And they fled in droves. And then their tasks were backfilled with people who really were not mathematicians. They were much more interested in more blue collar issues of data management. So we starved the project a little bit of the mathematicians. I believe we actually drove them off between 91 and 96. And you know, the few who stayed, there were some great people, don't get me wrong, but the, the flood of mathematicians we could have used was not there. So for someone like Phil Green to come along and to develop these quantitative measures on trained data sets was actually a pretty special lucky thing in my view. How did the Baylor College of Medicine Human Genome Sequencing Center come about? The pilot program came along to, to grow sequencing. And that was my thing, and I applied for that and received that. And on the heels of that, I said, I ought to be a genome center. So with a stroke of a pen and a small sign I put on my door, I said, I'm the Human Genome Sequencing Center at Baylor College of Medicine with my staff of 20 that grew to 60 or something in the program. These days, I can tell you, if you want to start the smallest center of anything under any circumstances, it needs an act of Congress. It's a much different day. Right. But back then it was the Wild West and I declared myself, the no one has ever, no one ever questioned it. And so I just became the Human Genome Sequencing Center. And we were externally funded, so there was nobody to come and say, you can't do that. Um, and so we, that's how we got, got seated. Can you talk about the origins of Solera and its influence on the HGP? I mean, there was, there was some interesting moments. Of course, that time he was joined at the hip to Tony White from uh, Perkin Elmer. And uh, Mike Hunkerpiller, um, who was really one of the unsung heroes of all of this period, well, maybe not unsung, but he's certainly one of the heroes of this whole period. Uh, he read the paper, the manuscript that I was referring to earlier, the one from Jim Weber and Gene Myers. And he had just overseen the development of the 2000, this box that did capillary sequencing and gave away the need to do gels, or did away with the need to do gel pouring. And um, he said, well, this maybe would work. And with knowing that he could raise the capital, knowing that that would stimulate business, he invited Craig to be the, the person uh, who would run Solera, and they cooked up that plan. I think Mark Adams flew out to California with Craig and met with Mike and Tony and handshake the deal, which was pretty bold in those days to do a hundred million or maybe two hundred million dollar deal with a handshake. I mean, I'm sure there was some follow-up paperwork, but it was it was bold and it was pretty exciting. So. It certainly electrified everybody's view. What were your thoughts on the idea of the draft genome sequence? So we, we liked the idea of a draft. We'd presented it. So it was not foreign to us. To us, it was never a, um, a science question because if you're doing a shotgun project, you can have intermediate products. That was scientifically logical. Really, the issue was social or sociological. We, are you committed to drive it to the finish, which you need to? So there was not the dichotomy. We didn't, we didn't engage the dichotomy in quite the way that uh, others might have. Can you tell us the story of sequencing the Drosophila genome? Shortly after that, um, they decided to use shotgun methods and they came to us. Jerry came to me and said, would we join with him in a grant to do a shotgun method because we were more experienced at doing shotgunning and the shotgunning of individual uh, clones it was not a whole genome shotgun. So we participated in that grant. The grant was funded right before Solera was announced. And of course, we were at Cold Spring Harbor again, uh, right when Solera was announced, discussing the ramifications. And uh, we all went to Plimpton, the room there, and we sat and listened to Craig say, go do the mouse. And he was going to do this and then he said, of course, I'm going to, we're going to do a warm-up genome. I'm not going to tell you what it is. And then as he walked out, he said, Jerry, come and talk to me in the corridor. <laughs> because, of course, Jerry was the Drosophila guy. It was pretty obvious he wanted to talk to Jerry about the 
just off of the genome. So, the, so that began the, the shotgun phase of that project. Now, as a recent, you know, we hadn't actually engaged in any work with Berkeley at that time. We were just beginning our engagement with them. But we reached an agreement that Jerry would pursue the shotgun phase with the Solera group. And then we would pursue the finishing phase with the Berkeley group. Yeah. It became extremely acrimonious. Okay. And that's a whole other story that probably doesn't need a lot of tape time. But um, I think both sides could have managed better that part of the project um, and, and had a happier outcome for the way the Drosophila project unfolded uh, with you know, the benefit of hindsight. But the project got done and, uh, and redone and redone. And, uh, and the, indeed, the execution of that shotgun genome was a real milestone on its own. What was your opinion of Francis Collins' leadership during the G5? I think brilliantly. I mean, with the benefit of being part of that time, plus a number of, I'm, a, I'm a, now a veteran of more consortia than I could possibly remember to name. And that one was the, the really the, the, the uh, set the bar. Because Fra Francis is an extremely talented manager, apart from his other skills. I mean, I can't say enough good things. He, he both set goals and he allowed people to do their thing and then he had forums for, you know, for the bits in between to be well talked through. And he, you know, he formed relationships with people. I, I just think he was a model to follow. It was just really great. And we had those Friday calls, you know, the G5 calls on Friday mornings, which became part of our lives. And they were managed well and they were reliable and, you know, there was minutes. What does a comprehensive catalog of human variation mean in the context of the Thousand Genomes Project? This is guided a bit by our now understanding of how rare, rare variation is. And um, of course, uh, you know, until we sequence everybody, we won't have every variant. There's so much new variation in, you know, we're, we're, you know the, this frequency spot, this site frequency spectrum is so steep. Let me say something about that though, just before the, uh, addressing the consequences of the curve. You know, when we, um, we did the Watson genome with with uh, 454, I don't know how well you followed that period of personalized genomics, but um, the, uh, the first few individual diploid genomes, actually the first one was Watson. Uh, Craig's was done a little after, Craig's paper came out a little earlier, but the first one was Watson and the data was generated at 454 and I was on the scientific advisory board, that's how we hooked up with them, we did the analysis. Now, that first thing we did was to compare the reference and Craig and Watson which gave us an idea of how much unique variation there was between the individuals. Right, so that's, and now, uh, I went around and I asked some of my learned colleagues, I said, how much rare variation do you know? How, how extensive is it going to be? Because I knew by this time I'm a little more seasoned than when I'd gotten off the boat from Australia. I knew that the, once the story was known, then the answers would be the story. And I asked uh, several people about what they thought that, that number would be. Nobody came close to the estimate of ex how many rare variants we had, you know, that, that you would find. So, you, you know, the simple question is, if we sequence you and you go into the doctor with your sequence, how many times do you think there'll be variation that no one's ever seen before? And the answers were always lower than what we got from, right. from that, that project. So it was a surprise how much rare variation there was. So now, with the benefit of knowing that, to answer your question, the answer is a straightforward one about we need to get this reference genome and we need to find the regions that are more commonly variable and we need to have tools to reliably discern the very rare ones in everybody when we want to. Because it matters, because people will be very different. Before, you might have stopped ahead of this need for these tools because the common variation, you know, if we got everything down to 0.5%, we're going to get most things people will have. So it wasn't until we knew that wasn't true that we had to change our answer to your question.